Hello and welcome to another edition of Trash Arts Tick, episode 9. With myself, Ryan, we got Sambo, and we also got Jackson. Hey. On today's show, what we're going to be discussing, we actually watched The Thing the other day, and it's the first time I actually watched it, believe it or not. Um, Sam and Jack have both seen it before, so we're going to do a little review on that. Also, we're going to be discussing the film industry and how it's evolved within the last 10 years. But um, within that, how the coronavirus has kind of accelerated things um, ever so slightly. So, without further ado, let's crack on, guys. The Thing. So, it was my first time seeing it, and uh, I was impressed. I, I wasn't expecting it, considering it's 80s horror. And... I don't know, you can say your own things about 80s horror, sometimes it's a little bit shoddy, but I was really impressed, I really liked it. Firstly, yeah. that, that comment on the 80s horror. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to you pick me up, gonna pull you up on that, <laughs> as soon as you started saying it. As soon as you revise those films, you'll watch them again and go, wait, do this is better than I remember. I mean, remember there is a lot of trash, don't get me wrong, but there's a lot of trash I at think all times in film. They're generally quite cheesy, but the thing really isn't... I mean, it, it kind of is as well, but it also, uh, because of its... Limitations? Because of, its, uh, because of the paranoia element in, that comes into it. It's not cheesy, but, but there, are, there are moments. That's 80s, they, though. Well, it's it? more corny lines as mm. opposed to... Because like, the thing is a film of pure dread. Mm. It's completely like... Well, isolation, paranoia plays into Cold War. It plays into, especially in the in the 80s of America, because you have the whole um, you have uh, Reagan pushing his anti-communist message towards like Russia and stuff like that. Of the who who could be the one who's you know like infect? Who, well, not infect in that sense, but who could be a communist? Yeah, yeah. A spy. Yeah. So that film came out. Of that sort of like. Not the obviously the sixties be more a peak point, but like a certain peak point in the eighties where it was still in mass discussion. The one thing that's interesting about when it was released, it came out the same summer as E. T. Ah, you did tell me this. Yeah, yeah, and because of that, the thing bombed, bombed horrifically because obviously they had just been introduced to that cute little long necked weirdo, and then the thing came along with I know a lot of people that were transformations. Absolutely... Oh. I know a lot of people who were absolutely terrified of E. T. Terrified of eating? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's... That, yeah, if that's a thing. Oh, yeah. hey! Because, <laughs> I mean, like, the thing, the, the aliens are genuinely are terrifying. It's, but, uh, it's horrific. So back to my original point. So, okay, I wouldn't say 80s films, horror films, in particular, are shoddy. I think they had their limitations. Yeah. But I remember growing up as a kid, watching some 80s horror films... You all almost got to see the creature very quickly, and because of their limitations, it was like, oh, okay, yeah, it yeah. breaks that. Uh, would you call it the fourth wall? It's almost like the illusion's gone. Sense yeah. of um, <laughs> sense of, of Believe belief. It, yeah. Yeah. Um. So then everything that you've watched up to that point is kind of oh well, uh, it's not really scary anymore. Whereas the one thing that I loved about the thing. And especially now being the age that I am, watching it, and it being from 1982. Yeah, 1982. There's always that element of, what is it? What's going on? Like, you don't really ever see it in its truest form, no. because it takes on the, the persona. Well, it infects people and then takes on their body. So what is it? It's the thing. It, yeah. it yeah. leaves it to your imagination, which I love. I think that that's one of, that is one of and the stronger facts. that's what works so well. Because yeah. even like the big monster reveal at the end where like you've got that giant fucking creature, you don't see it as, oh, that's its true form. It's like just an amalgamation of everything it's trying to collectively put together. Yeah, and it's desperate. It's a desperation mm. form that it's taken. I, I think that film, to me, is, is, has one of the best moments of uh, practical effects, oh, animatronics. Yeah. I, 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 it's outstanding seeing that they did that live on set like you know that's not cgi that's that's like one literally one continuous shot isn't it the head yeah oh yeah yeah like yeah crawls yeah. across you yeah know. yeah i remember the first time i watched the thing i was about 17 and i remember you're gonna say seven no <laughs> <laughs> i was about 17 and i remember those there's two scenes that really hit me and it was that one i just my mouth was open because I, I know that i'm watching a film but as a filmmaker and like you're just like how how, how do you do that and make it work so well? Yeah. 
And then the other scene is when they're all tied to the chair and the guy is starting to change and they're freaking out. I freaked out when I watched that. I remember going, oh my God, because I was just, because you didn't know who was going to be changing. And it works so well with that because they're, the they're, all freaking the, they're all freaking out, aren't they? And, and you've got such a great cast of just like, they're all archetypes. And they establish them right at the beginning of the film, just for a couple of lines. Like one of them smokes, one of them rollerblades, chef. One of them looks after the dogs. One of them's a bit conservative. One of them's a bit older. And it's just, they're all established so quickly. In a weird way, it's kind of like Predator. Yeah. The thing the thing does better to me than Predator is they're much stronger characters. You really like, you kind of feel like you, you get a vibe of who they are just from being in that environment and how long they've been there. But I think as well, even though that they get given their archetypes, you don't ever think, oh, such and such is going to get killed first because no. they have that stereotypical archetype. And, and the thing doesn't really follow that trend. Because uh, for me, one of the scenes that stands out is um, when Kurt Russell's character and another uh, bloke, can't remember the character's name, they go out into the snow and then it cuts and you're back inside and then it's it, it must have been a period of time and your other guys come back in covered in snow and it's like, I had to cut the rope. And yeah, yeah, then yeah. you're led to believe for ages that Kurt Russell... Yeah, MacReady's got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah MacReady's got it. Um, so, yeah, and you, like I believed it. I was like, mm. he definitely is. But then he took control of the situation and then you had that whole blood sample. I was still thinking it's him. He hasn't done his own blood. That must be the reason that he hasn't done his own blood. Mm. And then it just throws... And there's also, you, you, there's part of you going, is that going to work? Yeah. Is the blood thing going to work? They don't know if that's going to work. And then, of course, it does work. <laughs> it's well, you've you've seen South Park, so... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's the thing with... Um, it, when you're saying that kind of thing like the Doctor, I only really thought about it, I said it to you when we watched it, that when the Doctor does the test, and it's like, how far will it spread? And it's trying to find out more. He's one of the first people that the thing goes for because he learns too much straight away. And I never really thought about it like that until, you know certain situations we're in now it made me think of it like that that he was the guy that had more information so of course he was going to be taken quite quickly yeah because the thing's going to want to because it's a very intelligent thing it's not just a primal creation it's a very intelligent creation even if you don't see that full form it's always learning and understanding from others how to adapt to be them i don't know like it's just um i think the script the script is a very intelligent script in that respect it, it twists and turns you just don't know who's going to be who. And then on top of that, you've got John Carpenter's like shooting nice. it with those beautiful wides. And again, re-watching it, looking at how much practical effects are used when they're blowing it up. Yeah. They're just throwing, they're throwing bloody, what are they called? Um, cocktail, what are they called? Flaming cocktails. Molotov cocktails. Molotov. Molotovs. <laughs> yeah, they're just like throwing them in the explosion here and they're just walking. It's a continuous shot. They're just blowing the place up. It's insane how much dedication is given to that film and how on nearly on every level they just went, we're going to go all in. Yeah, yeah. All in with it. It's crazy. I think as well that the setting that it's in, the, the bleakness of the... Of the isolation. That, yeah. It, it's, it's, really, uh, it's really effective because it, it, by it being such a hostile environment, they can't, uh, they can't escape. They can't... Uh, they, they mu they've got to stay there. They've got to stay in that spot. They've got to defend to, themselves because yeah, they have to... no other resource to mm. be able to go and mm. like um, utilize, I suppose. Yeah, and and it means that it, it's very difficult for them to get help. It's very difficult for them to uh, leave. Yeah, I, I think that, that that environment is perfect for the, that kind of uh, changeling type type film yeah. because you've uh, there's a couple of these other uh, of other films. Um, I can't remember any off the top of my head. No, but, but um, a shapeshifter kind of yeah, the, you know, there's a lot of episodes of things of shapeshifters mm. in them, and the one problem with it is you just think, well, why it would just move on, like there wouldn't yeah, be. But yeah. this this puts the uh, the the shapeshifting alien thing and the uh, the humans in this position where they've only got one place that they can. Keep mm. uh, be uh, be safe in uh, because of the hostile environment. So like it, it pits them against each other in that way, and it's kind of it, I think that adds to it so much. Well, yeah, and even reinforcing that is the fact that the the characters towards the end realize that the only way we can stop this is by 
effectively stopping ourselves getting away. Yeah, mm. yeah. Doesn't have anything to take over, then it shouldn't survive. Mm. Is this similar? Like I was just thinking about when when Jack was saying that, like your first watching of the intro. Yeah, yeah. Cause... I was thinking. I was before. I was gonna talk about that. So <laughs> you weren't there when I watched it, Jack. Um. So basically, uh, the helicopter comes over and the dog's running. And I was like, why is he shooting at the dog? Like, <laughs> stop shooting at the dog. And I got really angry. <laughs> I got really annoyed and frustrated at him shooting at the dog. But then it obviously all made sense later on. It's such a, like, brave opening in that respect. Because people always have problems if you try and... If, you, if an animal dies over a human dies in films. Especially in horror films. So the fact the first thing you see is they're hunting this dog... And if you don't have any pretenses of what the film's about, your first mind is like, "What? Well, why? Why is why is he doing that? That doesn't seem right. He must he, he must be the bad guy." And then you realize, "Oh shit, he's trying to save him." Yeah, yeah. I think he ends up getting gunned down. Mm. I think another thing, um, again, going on that like every single level, this film works. Um, I apologize if I don't pronounce his name right, but Ine, uh, <laughs> Ineo Morricone's score. Yeah, yeah. Which is just outstanding. It's an amazing score. Which surprised me as well, because I know that John Carpenter, in a lot of his films, he ends up scoring his own mm. films. So that's kind of cool that he went and got another composer to do it. Well, so I heard that like um, John Carpenter, that, that basic riff at the beginning, he basically went, I want something like this. And, and, he, and he just went, okay. And then tweaked it to the smallest degree and then obviously the rest of the score kind of has a bit more of a different vibe. You were saying even it has some of the Western kind of vibes. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, he does gonna, a lot of I was going to make that comparison actually. The the, the idea that, that you know because of a, a Western, the setting of it is often like desert, isolated yeah, yeah. village environment. It's almost exactly the same, just sort of snow opposite temperature. Yeah. Yeah, the thing yeah that's actually quite a good analogy. So yeah, yeah. that's a really good analogy, and that's not something I actually thought about. It's that isolation. If you think about classic westerns, it always comes down to, you know, the gunslinger and the bad guy or whatever. And it's always like one-on-one um, -on -one with a duel or, you know, they're in a setting where it and is you just do, them. You do have uh, quite a few of those kind of moments in the thing. I mean, at the end, with the, and with the, the score two of them at the, that. at the end, that's kind of a, that's kind of a standoff well, in that very yeah, old-fashioned western sense. And If you look at most of John Carpenter's films, there's always a bit of a western element. Mm. Like, even the fact that he shoots mostly like in whites. Yeah. Like, he always shoots in those particular whites. It's a very western thing to do. Wide, long shots. <coughs> yeah. They prolong the shot. Mm. And like Assault on Precinct 13, that's basically a western he sort of set up. And he, yeah, like he's always got those little archetypes. I think I read somewhere that he's, he really likes westerns. And and let's face you it, Kurt Russell it. in that film is is a, is a cowboy. Yeah, like he is. Yeah. That's what he is. He's the yeah, macho, yeah. independent uh, man. You know, that's uh, associated with that kind of that genre as well. No, definitely. And it's it's interesting with the thing as well because as we know, the thing is not the original. Mm. The original is, and I believe I'm right. If I'm not, the poster will flash on the screen. Howard Hawks directed The Thing from Another Planet. Which is was it The Thing from Outer Space? It's either The Thing... It, it, the poster's on the screen. It's yeah. one of the posters. <laughs> but, um, yeah, like... In that original, here. <laughs> I always think with that original film, it's kind of like um, The Fly, in the sense that there's a 1950s version of The Fly, and then there's mm -hmm. the 80s version of The Fly, David Cronenberg's Fly. And both films, like... From what I know, again, not, I haven't seen the original 50s versions, but they completely surpass them. And again, it's because of the technology and the, the themes that they could explore through all the transformations. And you could do that so much in the 50s, you could only play with it so far. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a difference in, in terms of not just technology, but also in terms of the, the ability to... Uh, like culturally to talk about certain issues and sort of talk about certain things because at, at the time of those original films and not that I I haven't seen uh, those original films but uh, it was a very very different time in, in cinema in the way that you could talk about things and, and what it was okay yeah, to do because it was part of the nineteen fifties they had this whole sort of like because in the forties the Universal monster movies what happened with horrors in the fifties it kind of moved more into sci fi horror. Yeah, because of the fear of the atomic bomb and because of um, 
Well, events like well, Hiroshima, yeah, well, well, yeah, all that, like, the nuclear was becoming a bigger thing. Mm. So you got more films about giant ants or someone turning into a fly because science went wrong or, yeah, and the thing, an alien form that can take over people. In some ways, again, it, it, it reflects back to invasions of the body snatchers as well. It's that same sort of concept, which is kind of annoying when you look at the... They say prequel is probably a remake. Again, not going to watch it, never will watch it. But the thing that came out in 2011? I, I know it. <laughs> that sounds like the title of the, the thing that <laughs> came out in 2011. <laughs> that's supposed Anyone to be... who had a kid in 2011, <laughs> we're not talking about that. <laughs> it, it's supposed to be like a, a prequel to the thing. It's supposed to be about the Norwegians, but with an American cast and with Always CGI. Works. And I'm, it just, I always felt like it was a cash grab. Like, never would wanted to give it a chance. Because at least you know with the 80s thing, there are things they want to talk about. And again, the origins of the original. But this one, 2011, they weren't talking about anything. They were just doing it because they thought the brand could make them some money. And I feel like this story, you need to have a lot more of um, an intelligent mindset with what you want to do with it. Because it opens so many options to look at what's happening in society with that concept of paranoia. That, I mean, that's the reason why we watched it and reviewed it today, because of what's happening in our society right now in that reflection of that paranoia, you know? And I feel like when they, they remade it a third time, it didn't even bother to put any of that kind of, that context to it. It just makes it redundant. Again, if people have watched it, they can comment and tell me that I'm wrong, and then maybe I'll watch it. I get but, what you're saying. Yeah. I think it's like, <clears throat> on the bare basis of it, you're talking about the element of the unknown, something mm. that you don't know, you're not aware of. Um, and how do you defeat something like that? And especially whenever it hits so quick and it starts to, well, in the thing, um, whenever it starts to embody people and impose themselves, you can't even see it. You don't even know that it's there. And then they do that blood test. Yeah, yeah. And then it's there and it's like, oh my God. So it's almost like an antidote to a degree. Mm. So yes, I can understand what you're saying in terms of mirroring with what's going on right yeah. now. And, um, it, it, and that... it does heighten your senses a little yeah, bit it makes you more perceptive it's interesting you say about that reinforcing idea as well that like it reinforces the fear of the unknown because that's the thing when we fear the unknown our first response and it's, set, and it's what happens in the thing is defensive we turn against each other whatever little circle mm. we're in if there's something we know that's been spread within it we turn against each other immediately and I mean more so in a horror film obviously because they got to build in that dread pretty quickly but, it, but it's interesting how, like, you know, that will always be a universal feeling. Because you're right, it is the fear of the unknown. Hmm. I think that actually touches on a point on, uh, on what the problem with the prequel um, is. Is that, you know, you are playing on the fear of the unknown. And so if you're going to shoot yeah. a prequel that yeah, ends that. where the where first <laughs> film starts, <laughs> it's you like, know it exactly what's yeah. happened. It yeah. completely makes the, the thing, the 1982 version, redundant. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, because... <laughs> you're retired. Here's your check. <laughs> I mean, fortunately, now they seem to like because obviously we talked about a couple of weeks ago that they're do they're potentially doing another thing because Bloomhouse found a script from the original book that's never been used and they're looking to do the thing from that story as opposed to the classic story. Okay. But if it's Bloomhouse with the success of Invisible Man. Yeah, and Halloween. Yeah. There's, there is potential there. I mean, I feel like that idea might be thrown away now because of what's happening. Yeah, 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 yeah. But we'll see. We'll see. Well, Blumhouse tends to allow, uh, you know, the directors to do what they what they want more so than uh, than other studios, from what I understand, anyway. Yeah. Um, so I think that could be interesting, especially if you're not going for a prequel or you're not going for like a direct sequel or anything like that. Just a a, a reimagining. Uh, that's it cool that. as, as we've all kind of said the concept can always be re-explored mm. there is always a story to tell within that depending on what's happening in society even if you want to tell that story in like I know we've discussed it but like if you want to tell it in 12th century Viking kind of story you could still tell the concept of the thing in those just times just give out our ideas no, now, so. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, yeah exactly and I agree on that point I think as well what it comes down to is execution. Yeah, yeah. And that's Absolutely. what John Carpenter just nails. It's, it, it's my favourite horror film of all time. It's the best thing I personally think Carpenter ever thing. directed. You know, can't stop saying thing. <laughs> no pun intended. 
No, like I say, it comes down to execution, and um, I think whenever it comes to modern horrors where they try and remake something, and this is probably what Bloomhouse are trying to avoid in a certain way. I could be wrong, I don't know, um, but from the two films that I've seen by them so far, in terms of Halloween and uh, The I Invisible Man. I guarantee you've seen more films Probably. from Blumhouse. Okay, so, well, them two in particular. <laughs> from the, the remakes sort of yes, side. Yeah. yeah. Oh, right. I yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, they've been, like, quality, but what they did is they kept the original content. Like, that, that sort of... With Halloween, whenever you have that... Um, I think in the first original, it was Michael Myers who gets pushed off the balcony and he ends up on the floor outside and then he disappears when she yeah, comes back yeah. and then they reversed it yeah. for the remit so they kept the like the, the key elements there whereas with a lot of modern day horrors they try and add something new how are we going to jump scare the audience how are we going to make it better and it doesn't always work i think sometimes it's either adding it's, something new or they just literally do it frame by frame exactly the same yeah, as yeah but, but they it's make it more gritty or yeah. something yeah. like that they uh, go like let's make it more real and it's like I don't want to see CGI a more real or the metal. music like, uh, or the music <laughs> like I know in stereotypical horror the music does lead up to a point but they with Halloween again they use the music to a certain degree but then you have jump scares where there is no music yeah, which yeah. is something that the original Halloween didn't necessarily maybe, do maybe so this that's is a, like a refresh yeah. but the truth sorry, is I'm just, maybe this is another no, 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 maybe we should do a whole podcast on remakes reimagining that's a good yeah, idea if you want that give us a like if you would like us to do that <laughs> well, no, just give us a idea. like anyway and uh, comment below comment yeah. <laughs> anyway but yeah, sorry, I'm getting sidetracked. But my point being um, is that if <coughs> Bloomhouse are going to do it, I really think that it's in safe hands. From examples of what we've seen before, they're going to keep key elements of the original within it with a fresh new taste towards it. Hopefully. See, all, Touch all, wood. I'm, all I'm seeing right now, and it's kind of lovely, and, it, and hopefully Bloomhouse will follow it through like they have with Halloween, is a true respect for John Carpenter. Yeah. Because, like, I mean, sure, he's been respected at least, good, like, five years or so now. But considering the guy, every film he made in the 80s bombed, and he independently wanted to do it the way he wanted to do it, and in the 90s he couldn't get much work, and they became more studio-esque, and he kind of lost being who John Carpenter was. Now he's finally getting that respect, and that's why I hope if they do a Thing remake, they can respect the craft that he brought to the first one. Or at least even get him involved in the score or something as well. Yeah, well... That'd be awesome. It wouldn't be in any moment. moment. No, I know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if... Uh, I think we should... Because we've, we've discussed it. We, we're going to bring it in. If you were to rate this film, if you were to give it out of 10, what would be your rating? Who are you asking? I'm looking you? at you. <laughs> you don't know I'm looking at you. So, Ryan... <laughs> I'm looking at you. <laughs> um... So yeah, on considering I hadn't actually seen it, and uh, it's an 80s film, and I've been disappointed by 80s horrors in the past, I personally really enjoyed this, so I'd probably give it like a 9 out of 10. Nice. Absolutely. See, I um, eventually we will review a film where like not all of us love the film. <laughs> Today is not that day. We do have films in mind, <laughs> so uh, one of them is probably going to be Star Wars, but yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's another time. But yeah, personally for me, The Thing is a 10 out of 10, but that's because it is my favourite horror film of all time, so there's no way around that score changing. Really, I, I was, I was going to say, I think, an 8.5 and eight and out of 10, because like, I, I really, really enjoy the film, and but to me, it's missing certain elements that I, I like in, in certain yeah. things, um, but... Eight and a half out of ten is, is pretty high. Uh, I, I do love that film. I was trying to be quick witty there and think of a horror film that you could rate. But <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll leave that. So guys, now we're going to discuss um, the impact in film over the last sort of ten years. Um, yeah, and the, the reason that we decided to kind of get into this is obviously with the introduction of Apple, you've got Amazon, you've got Netflix coming to the game with uh, video on demand, how does that impact cinema as it is now? And especially in our current climate with coronavirus, how is that going to impact in the future? So, um, yeah, we wanted to kind of have an open forum, talk about this, and, uh, yeah, see where it goes, guys. So, the floor is yours. 
Well, I wanted to say, like, um, one of the reasons I remember we got Netflix back in 2013, when it properly launched, was Arrested Development. Yeah. And House of Cards was the other reason that everyone got Netflix. There was not one single interest in a film. Because in the beginning, like, this is only seven years ago, no one was interested in a Netflix film. And it's only over, like, I think the first film they, like, funded as the Netflix we know now was Beast of No Nation. You ever seen it? No. <laughs> Excellent film. Uh, Carrie Fukunga, the guy who's doing a uh, Bond 24. Oh, really? 25, sorry. 25. And uh, did True Detectives. It's an amazing film with Idris Elba. It's about um, the African soldier, uh, the boy soldiers. Really good film. <clears throat> and they immediately wanted to go into the Oscar game. And I remember this was the year of Oscar oh so white. And essentially, like, everyone was saying how great the film was and how Idris Elba deserved an Oscar nomination. And they were like, Netflix, Netflix aren't going to be able to do that. It's not going to happen. They have to put it in theatres. They have to put it in theatres because that's what, how the Oscars play. And then they didn't get an Oscar nomination despite getting a SAG nomination, a Golden Globe nomination, a BAFTA nomination. Still didn't get an Oscar nomination. And it was like, Oscars will never take Netflix seriously. That was the ceremony in 2016. Yeah. We come to now, and everything's completely changed. And I've always said, rightfully so, it shouldn't matter that a film's out in a cinema to get the exposure. All that should matter is that good filmmakers are getting money to make films and getting it promoted and released. And getting recognition for it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, like, part... <sighs> Part of the reason that Netflix is is able to take so much more risks in terms of giving people a creative opportunity is that they don't work in the same uh, way where they have like uh, numbers and a box office and all of that that kind of stuff. Once it's on there, their subscribers can watch it, but th what they really want is new subscribers. Yeah. That's the key and thing. so they they can play this game where they take risks and try to hit niche audiences because ultimately they're just building their their uh, mass audience if 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 you like, um, which is entirely different to any any way that another studio has worked previously. But I think as well on that point is you can actually hit more of a mass audience. Um, through video on demand or through Netflix than what you could through box office. Mm. Like uh, it was up until what maybe a year ago, a cinema ticket cost what a tenner, twelve yeah. quid to just for one adult, right? Then you want popcorn on top of that if you're into that. You get a drink, you know. Before you know it, you spent near enough thirty quid to go and watch mm. one film. Whereas actually, that that's one film in one night. Right? Let's say there's a few films that come out in that month. You can't necessarily go and see all them films. So you've got to prioritise which film that you want to see the most. Whereas with Netflix, you pay a subscription that's a monthly amount that's less than a cinema ticket. Okay, granted, not necessarily now if you go with View. Um, but yeah, you get all these other like films and you can have that nostalgia feel as well of going back over and watching films that you've seen before or you wait like a year, two years, and you get that film that was a box office release that's on Netflix. Yeah. Well, this is the thing, like, Netflix had to have this whole entire fight for a long time, and you saw it all with the film festivals. Oh, we won't screen your film because you're going to screen it day's day release, because you're going to screen it, like, when you release it, it goes immediately all across the world. And because that pisses off cinemas, and it pisses off certain distributors and certain, like, territories and stuff, they had been fighting against this for so long. And that's why it was ignored from the Oscars. Or I remember when, I can't remember what the film was, but when a Netflix film screened at Cannes Film Festival for the first time, and the little title came up where it goes, ba -ba, the audience laughed. Because they were like, oh, this because it's very snobbery. Mm. And that's what a lot of this has been coming down to. And, and they had kind to change it. Kind of breaking that trend. Well, I think, I think the more talent they kept going to them, they were like, we're going to have to start rethinking how we I, see this. I think the snobbery is kind of exposed in the way that they've argued against Netflix. Um, uh, like, you know, you saw in the Oscars this year, like, uh, quite a few times, they, they talked about um, how you can't watch a film properly on a phone or you can't watch a film properly on a computer screen. Well, to be honest with you, the majority of 
people can't really afford to go to the cinema yeah, to see yeah, every yeah, single yeah. film. That backs so up the my majority point. of the yeah. films that we watch anyway are going to be on a computer screen or on a TV screen. But this is the, this so is that, uh, you know, so what? Like we we're used to it. <laughs> that's the thing with, with that kind of grounded understanding of like we're working class, yeah. We we, we what? We, <laughs> we're, not the, the, <laughs> we're not in the elite the, the elite bubble where they go. Oh, that's not what real cinema is. It's like people just want to watch films. Mm. They just want to watch films by good filmmakers where the filmmakers aren't having to worry about building a universe or having to adhere to like certain kind of things that are trending at that time. They just want those, those directors to be given the money, made their films, and hopefully do something good out of it. It's easy for someone with their own <coughs> home cinema to demand the big screen experience, yeah, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, and <laughs> that, that's a different level, isn't it? And I, I know from being a passionate filmmaker, and, and you guys will probably back me up on this, is that you don't necessarily go and... Well, we've gone and seen, seen, uh, seen films in the cinema, um, but we've prioritised what film we want to go see, etc. Mm. Um, but like, you don't necessarily just want to go to the cinema just to see that film. You... you you kind of appreciate a film for the artistry behind it, the mm. fact of the way that it's been constructed, the screenplay, the script, um, the direction, the acting. Yeah, you know, yeah. And maybe I'm talking slightly out of turn for general people who just watch a film for the sake of watching a film, but even Netflix gives you that. Mm. Yeah, Video on the demand thing. gives you that. So much yeah. into that. And from my, my own experience, I, I, not that I was a snob or anything, but I know that. Um, my mindset has changed over the years as video on demand has become more mainstream, become mm. bigger, that I'm more likely to watch a Netflix original or an Amazon original mm. than go to the cinema and watch a big blockbuster simply because they are decent quality, they're, they, they, they're funded well, you know, um, they're enjoyable to watch, they have very good stories, whereas before I probably wasn't enjoying stuff like that. Truth is, if we look at That's just video my mindset's on demand. changed. Like, just looking at video on demand as a filmmaker. Mm. The key thing to me when it comes to audience with to watch my films is there to be an audience. Yeah. And we work with a lot of video on demand sites. We work with independent ones. And that's the other thing that's been a massive rise in. And we work with some great ones like this, Media and Stream Now TV. Little plug there. <laughs> but, um, and even like, even people like Troma, they have their own like VOD site. Everyone has their own VOD site. We were about to go into this massive like VOD sort of nightmarish kind of streaming war. And the independents felt that they were going to get lost within that. Now, because of the situation now, there is so much access to just films. Mm. And there is no desperation for it has to have a cinema release to be seen as legitimate. Because that was one thing like, it kind of, if you go like way back in time, if you think about in the 90s when you had cinematic releases and then you had straight to video horror sequels. Yeah. Or straight to video. It was like a class sequels. thing, yeah. wasn't it? It almost became like that. And I'm hoping that like, because there is no cinemas right now, that barrier kind of breaks away. Well, the divide isn't there anymore, is yeah. it? You have yeah. to, like, it's to a means to an end, isn't well, it? And they've been fighting this for so long, and now they have no choice. As we've seen, Universal have, like, pretty much that whole bloody list that we were saying over the last couple of weeks of the films <laughs> that were coming out that month, all of them will be out immediately by the end of March. So that's including, like, um, The Hunt, Invisible Man, which came out on the, uh, March 13th. Sonic's going to be out by the end of the month. Bloodshot's coming out. All films that, to be honest with you, didn't make much money and probably wouldn't have. Now they're going to get more of an immediate release. Even Bird's Prey is going to And I think they're probably going to do better for it because they're going to be uh, more mobile in the way of like reaching their, their niche audience. So... Th yeah, they they're gonna have they're gonna find it easier to get to people on a vod site, and probably they will see a better return. Mm. I think probably to back up that point ever so slightly, but in a roundabout way, is that yeah, they long game, they're gonna end up with more money, but ultimately from their narrow mindedness to a certain extent, um, what brings in the biggest revenue at any one given point, a theater release. Right, but you can only sustain a the a theater release for 
a so period long. of time. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's and always that duration. Your first weekend yeah. box office as well. Then there's that duration. And then you pick up on like Blu-ray, DVD sales. Whereas what they're going to find now is that by having the margins smaller, by going, what, what is it, digital release? Yeah, basically it's like a day like, in, day out release. So, it's... so doing, that, well, even if they rent it, yeah. like if that margin's smaller, more people are going to buy it. So the profit is bigger. But the funny it's thing like, is, it's like, crazy. because the box office, there's been a whole discussion on the box office this year. And I think I've said it a few times, so there's been a bit of a decline. Surprise films like Bad Boys Free, yeah. but horror, there was a horror film every week and they just kept going down. And there was this fear that perhaps the future of dramas, horrors and comedies are only going to be VOD investments. And mm -hmm. cinema will only be for those bigger films. Which in some ways is a good thing, because at least you're getting the right audience for it and you're not desperately seeking box office numbers, you can just look on the quality of it. But then of course the coronavirus happens and now everything's immediately VOD. Yeah. And it's, it's just so strange because to me, like the whole argument of streaming is snobbery. It's completely down snobbery because the money's made, so it's not a money thing. They can't say, oh, we're not going to make enough money because now they're forced in a situation. They have to make their money that way. Yeah. But because of the constant, like the idea of an acclaimed film couldn't be it. And this is where it comes interesting when Amazon got into the race. Now, Amazon, like when they first started their VOD thing, as, as we know as filmmakers, they initially were doing a pilot season where you could send them a screenplay and uh, you could potentially get it made. And they opened it up to all filmmakers. I know a lot of people send things in, I send the script in. And then when they actually announced what the pilot season were, it was all filmmakers of acclaim. Or it was people with some like B-list actors or just something that you go, oh, I know that name. So the whole point of that was just to create that sort of, hey, we care about you indies. But we don't, we still wanna know where the money's at. And the Oscars kind of opened the doors more to them there because then they started getting a lot more praise. The festivals were happier with them because Amazon's initial approach was not to do immediate release. Mm. It was to play the game, do like a very limited cinema release and slowly release it. And then two, three months later, boom, it's out. But also they, they, had that, they had that whole thing where even though you had Prime, you still had to pay for certain films that were new releases, even their they own still releases. Have it. And so they still have It's crazy to me. Um, and yet they got approval. Yeah, but but by but by doing that, they they got more approval from the establishment because they yeah. put more barriers in place to being able to watch it that way. But and I think Netflix, where it was much more of a you pay a subscription, you get everything. Yeah, that's more of a threat to them. Yeah, but that's where I think Amazon has fallen down massively. So Amazon want to be um, one of the front runners, if not the front runner, in terms of video on demand. Netflix are a league and above and beyond yeah. them because when you go onto Amazon Prime, like you literally go on and you, you're scrolling through, and you're like, oh yeah, I'd love to watch that. Film. It's like, oh, rent this film, and they've still got so it's it's almost um, oh, what do they call them? Mi uh, micro transactions within within the yeah. the format of what it is, and it's just bull because. You think you've got everything, and then you're limited to, oh, a film that came out six years ago. Uh, yeah. The thing is, well, I... Netflix always kind of was like Blockbuster. They knew that if they kept getting loads of stuff out there, that the money is not going to be made from those acclaimed films, but they'll be able to afford from the acclaimed films. The money comes from those, like, teen romantic comedies. Yeah. They do really well on Netflix. They don't even need names in them. They're low, they're low budget, but they go universally around the world. They have universal themes. They can hit that audience. It's the same when you're in a blockbuster and people used to just pick up a vi video case and go, oh, that looks good. And they'd rent it. It's the same what how Netflix were working in some ways. Whereas Amazon just kind of wanted to give the allure that they're trying to get in this for the acclaim idea. And now look at them. None of those films made any money. So they backtrack and they've gone diving back into TV with doing a billion commitment to Lord of the Rings. I think where Netflix uh, read. slightly off topic, ever so slightly, but Netflix also done very, very well in terms of documentaries, and I think they absolutely is. Well, that. you know, they started <coughs> as a film distributor for documentaries I before they that. were a VOD site. That's okay. why they're always high quality. They can appreciate what is quality in documentaries, and it is rare. You're right. Like they, they. Because if you think about the generation that Netflix truly, supposedly is for, not for, but where it came out for, it's the millennial generation. 
mm. and we we've begun <laughs> to have a, a, a more of a, an appreciation for a form that generally speaking documentary form for a long time was very much just to the acclaim older audience or at least that was the thought but now the way that the netflix generate documentaries like frequently as well mm -hmm. and yeah sure more on the tv side but on the film side they're still getting them out and they're getting the oscar acclaim for it i feel like yeah that there's that you're right they are a lot higher quality so do you know are the are the oscars are other film festivals now having to accept are they going to have to accept more uh, video on demand direct releases now because you know, where so many big films now are going to direct release on VOD. But that's if they're going to happen. Well, yeah, obviously well, with still Khan, a that's... bunch of films. That's the thing. Like a good, actually, good example of that is the um, South by Southwest festival. Mm. They um, cancelled the ceremony, but they gave screeners online, so those films could still get reviews going out. They might find it at least it gives them some sort of traction for distributors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially the films that don't have sales, and Khan for a long time was like, "We're not going. We're going to do the film festival. It's going to be the greatest thing for humanity." And then France <laughs> kept going, "You can't do the festival." <laughs> <laughs> and now they're not doing it. It's supposedly rescheduled for the end of June. We will see. Mm -hmm. Now the thing is, film festival season. It, it's one of those things where it's all about launching yourself into an Oscar campaign or having something that's word of mouth, and. For a long time, again, they wouldn't allow Netflix to be part of that conversation. A lot of that is to do with France's laws on streaming. Where I think it's if you screen, you have to screen in a, fr a French cinema, and then three years later they release it on VOD or something. But again, that's that's all going to change. Um, it's just a computer randomly starting up. Just if it's not ghost. the cats, <laughs> it's the computer it's technology. <laughs> But that's the thing, like, uh, and w when it comes to the Oscar race now with streaming, I think I read um, that essentially even the BAFTAs have to reconsider now. So does okay. that not go back to Jack's earlier point in his question that, like, they're going to, well, you said the BAFTAs going to have yeah, to rethink, yeah. but everyone's going to have to rethink. So how, does, how do you think that's going to ship the Oscars come, what, February 2020? Oh, I don't how think... are they going to have to accept more Netflix films? Because if... if I don't think that... The thing is, that's not the... The, the, the thing is... I don't the think box it's office isn't a consideration. It has to be on the quality of the film. Oh yeah, of yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, in, let's know? rephrase it then. Let's rephrase it. So, if a film that was due to come out this month, let's say for example, the films we reviewed, right, or we kind of yeah. said were coming out in March, right? The Invisible Man got a bit of a release date, but Blood Shot wasn't actually really released in a cinema. I mean, I don't. Is there? <laughs> But I know that that's no. But that, just as an example, let's let's switch that and say that was a blockbuster film, okay? Yeah. And a lot of blockbuster films being pushed back. But if a blockbuster had, like fallen into that category and then got released on, uh, well, virtual yeah. download, the, the digital download, um, does that then mean that they would then be considered because it didn't have a theater release? So this well, is this the is thing. It. So but, that's what I'm asking yeah. you. So then what do you think then happens? I think if the BAFTAs are having a conversation about it at the moment and saying we're going to have to accept streaming as opposed to a direct cinema, um, a limited theatre release. But they have accepted streaming before. They have. They've still been a bit like... they about to, it. Yeah. But the Oscars, on the other hand, it depends on where we're at with the virus. That's the truth. Cause yeah, the you Oscars, know it's going to be around for at least... Let, let's even say... If we go with what our government's saying, 12 weeks, right? Yeah. 12 weeks' time, that's three months. So we're looking at Well, Oscar June. season doesn't start to December. Okay. And if, it, if, if everything is in this case, I think they will just have to be lenient with it. Otherwise, it's just like, what's the point? What's the point of being that rigid where, no, it has to be in the cinema, but, like, but there's no cinemas open. <laughs> how, how can you argue that? That's, that's just pointless. Like, that's why I think the BAFTAs are starting that discussion. And you have to remember, a lot of the members of the BAFTAs are members of the Oscars. Yeah. So it will go round to that point where I think if it is a continuing case by the end of the year, then they will be just getting streaming sites. Because they still get like DVD screeners. So like, what's the difference between that and getting a little online link where they have to put a password in? I mean, there is the question of piracy. That piracy is definitely going to increase. Mm. 
and it's one of those horrible situations that's, where it's that's like, the, what, what that's, that's another reason that that the industry is being forced into a new direction as well yes. actually, yeah, that, absolutely you know, the, the change in that um because if everyone is going to be able to see your film for free if they want to you might as well find a way that can get it to them it, it yeah. better that it still I, makes you revenue back and I, I kind of agree with you and disagree with you on that sense simply because if they haven't released it in cinema there isn't necessarily a copy out there so how can anyone like piracy oh uh, because there would be screeners and they, they often yeah. get no, leaked but it, uh, okay you know, yeah yeah so there, there's always ways that these films come out yeah okay <laughs> so yeah I, I get okay yeah so your point is basically that rather than run the risk of a leak then just release it on digital yeah. download release and then they still get revenue. I mean, I'm, I'm going to burst your bubble a little bit there. It's easier to piracy a film that's released online. That's what I was going. Well, that's so that's my point. Yeah, 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 no, I, I know that it's easier. But, but why same. run... I get what you're saying. So, Jack, I get what... I, I, so, I yeah. was saying what you were going to say, Sam, but... With you, Jack, I, I was just going to say... It dis, uh, disincentivizes the person who is who is illegally downloading if, they can if they've already got a Netflix subscription yeah. and yeah, they it, can already watch it. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. 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 And I get what you're saying. It, it's kind of... And this is probably... We're, we're three guys in a, <laughs> a studio talking on a podcast right now. Um, <laughs> and... <A> kitchen brush. <laughs> All right, Portsmouth. <laughs> what geese? Um, but like, how oh, you completely threw my train of thought. Sorry, Sorry dude. <laughs> I get your point, and I completely understand that. And um, you you wouldn't want to run the risk of piracy, so why not take the revenue while you where you possibly can? Um, but I also kind of am with Sam with on this is that the more you put it out there easier it is to download you think around box off season or box off oscar season um the amount of films that like are easily downloadable mm. not that we've done it um that are easily downloadable um and of a higher quality yeah it would be exactly the same if they like digitally released it yeah but i just think i think there is a difference in that you know people want to see things quickly and like you know, as soon as something's released, people are like, "Oh, I want to see that." Yeah. Or even before it's released, they say, "Oh, I want to see that immediately." If it's hyped up enough, I as think, well. and, and they don't want to pay the extortionate prices. For if the I'm cinema. honest with you, so yeah, yeah, yeah. The the, the, um, the other side to that, of course, is the fact that basically, because we've got so many streaming sites, and this is where the streaming wars were about to kick in, because mm. as we know, Disney Plus is here. Yeah. And when you've got HBO Max, and you've got every network or studio wants a streaming site and they will that then brings too many films that if you're not rich you ain't gonna own all those oh, yeah. sites and that's where piracy will definitely yeah, it will, yeah. i think i think it through the sort of diversification of it in in terms of the big businesses jumping in and that's cool it is really, going yeah. to it is going to destroy that notion of being mm. able to put something out on one platform and you know as much as I don't think we should have a monopoly necessarily, I do think that uh, you know Disney having that much power with its own streaming site as well is kind of that's 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 wrong. That's that's weird. Right? Well, it's all that's the thing. I with again with everything happening right now, it's hard to know because they've had to be pushed so quickly forward towards this. Mm. There was a plan. There was a timer. Take it time, and they like. Like I said, they wanted to basically the eventually comedies would be mostly just that VOD sort of deal. They were going to go towards that, the smaller films that make less money. Now they have to do a blockbusters. That's insane, you know? So with the Disney Plus stuff, yes, they've kind of taken over. The one thing that frustrates me is that if all these other types of channels or businesses, studios, whatever, want to get involved in VOD... Um, they should, I, I, again, I understand your point about it being financially affordable, but give it to everyone. I hate these companies, like what Disney Plus did, right, it would frustrate the living fudge and bear out of me, is that they released Disney Plus and they amped up the Mandalorian, right? But it's only in America and selected countries and stuff. And yeah. we're getting it in the UK next week. It's like, well, hold on. We're in the middle of March now. We're talking near enough five months. Mm -hmm. since it, so what, you're expecting me to wait five months 
to watch one of your con and then you're expecting me to pay a subscription. So that's what heightens piracy. So <clears throat> back up your point, Sam, is that yeah, whenever they do start bringing out more of their content and their films and stuff, and they don't give it to everyone, they're actually only alienating themselves because they're not giving themselves a fair opportunity. But then at the same time, when you've got too many different VOD sites, you're not going to be able to subscribe to all of them, well, which becomes, again is going to increase. It becomes bloated, and this was this was what happened, I think, with TV towards the end of like I mean I'd say the end of TV, but obviously it hasn't ended. But you know the TV has been uh, you know watching live TV, I mean not TV shows, um, ha has been rapidly declining, and uh, that's partly uh, because it became overly bloated with all of these different channels that mostly are showing repeats of things from the past. Yeah. Um, and, and you have to get all buy packages to, for, for a channel or for a set of channels. And so people kind of just, uh, you know, they just end up uh, not bothering with it and looking for something that's easier and VOD was easier at the time. What used I think to it's work. it's going to become worse. If, what what used to work with stuff like that is that I remember when Game of Thrones first came out, it was a HBO original. Mm. Um, they had the rights to it, but the only way it could show over in the UK was on Sky. Um, so they obviously have an agreement. So then you get the best of both worlds because it's not being tainted because Sky still get their revenue. But then what ended up happening after that is like HBO, what? Well, that's probably a bad example. Fox is probably a better example. They probably sold off to like BT with Walking Dead or Fear the Walking Dead. Um, <clears throat> and then they end up having their own channel and then they take it away, but then the English people can't watch it. it, it yeah. It's and all it the just licensing laws. It's yeah. just yeah. This is the thing. And then they laws. start doing repeats. Mm. Well, so Sky One is just tainted these days because mm. it's just a case of reruns or mm. and even their original shows are Kind of all right, but then but, they created Sky Atlantic, and it's just yeah. returning back to film rather than just <laughs> yeah. Sorry, yeah, about yeah. TV repeats. But it's still VOD to no, a no, degree. Of course, of course, like the thing that um, with there being so much, we're not talking about the thing anymore, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> with there being so much like clout of just channels, like you said in, in the old days when it was cable, and there's just so many channels of nothing, and VOD will find itself in a similar position. Yeah. yeah. Where this brings hope for independent filmmakers is that people do then start to get kind of like, they, they start to look to more, they're more like local businesses. You start going to the smaller VOD sites, you start building up more Looking for that fresher content. Yeah, and I'm seeing it all the time. I, I see so many like indie VODs coming up at the moment. It's like the one you downloaded. Yeah, um, or Shudder. To. Shudder's a great one for indie horror. That, that um, they're giving a thirty day um, They're giving away a thirty day subscription to anyone right now, and it's great. There's, there's not even that much content for all the hype I heard about Shudder. I thought there'd be a hell of a lot more. They're a lot smaller than I thought they were, but the hype about how great they were was like kind of overwhelming. It makes you curious, and I'm finding the same thing with a lot of other indie ones like Availed Films one that we've recently signed to, they're just picking up on all these other indie filmmakers. And I think you're only going to see more of that, especially now. And that opens so many options for filmmakers who just want to get their work out there and get that audience. Like we said earlier, we are not in a position where we need to be disappointed if we never release a film in the cinema. It yeah. doesn't mean anything. It's the same with a DVD release and a Blu-ray release. If it's got an audience and someone's willing to market it and sell that film to an audience doesn't matter where it is. And I think the future is kind of bright for indie filmmakers if they can get the old notions of what cinema used to be out of their heads. Yeah. We've almost been forced to have to accept. Well, their hands been forced, yeah. hasn't it? And I think indie filmmakers need to pick up on it quickly. Yeah, and I think I think there's room for indie indie filmmakers now to actually make an impact on this in the you know the way that the the market has changed the way that vod is is so much more accessible um to uh, filmmakers and to mm. audiences especially right now yeah. yeah sorry to interrupt you just to butt in very quickly but loads of streaming sites are offering discount because loads of people are self-isolating yeah yeah um 
but to me as uh, as well things like things like the coronavirus any kind of crisis within society often brings out the um contradictions in in sort of industrial kind of plans and industry plans and stuff like that um I won't get too Marxist theory on you, but <laughs> like, it, it does force this progression of like you know um, uh, having to go out and reach uh, a, a grassroots level more because you don't have the options otherwise. The last thing I want to say on it, and like again, sticking with the hope for independent filmmakers, not so much about the subscribers and the audience because the audience will always have something to watch. Yeah. Hell, they could go back to the DVDs. If the internet yeah. goes, the DVDs are still sitting I there. think some people have got rid of all of their DVDs. <laughs> potentially, now. potentially. But the thing that I want to like talk about what I think is the future is um, community of creativity. And we're, we're hoping to do something similar within Trash Arts. So we have decided to do a horror comedy anthology mm. that basically is for those in isolation. And we, we are going to be sending it out on Monday and people can just film these, um, like an audition piece for a, a, a cursed evil talent show. Just a bit of fun. You, you don't have to be in isolation to submit a film. No. <laughs> it's just but those... it's a film that you can shoot in your own home, so there's no uh, no way that you can't be involved. And it's called You're Gonna Be a Star. Yeah, and the thing is, the reasoning behind doing it is that it's very easy for creatives to fall into paranoia and fear and anxiety. Creatives are already kind of anxiety prone. All you need to do in those situations is essentially use creativity. You, that is one of the things that you want to be driven towards anyway, and we have the limitations of the security of having to work. Some people who are in isolation, this is just an opportunity. Don't just sit there and think, and think about all the things that are worrying you. Create. Yeah. And it would be great if we can get lots of people involved in this anthology, and I'm seeing it happening more. You see it on social media other indie filmmakers who are coming up with similar ideas to get people still working and to still thinking and still creating. And that's where I think things are going to keep going, hopefully, for indie films at the moment. Just to touch on that point, if you want to do something for You're Going to Be a Star, you can get as creative as you want, be as quirky as you want. You know, if you want to include, I don't know, we were talking the other day about the cats. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, doing a green screen. I'm not going to give it away. You can watch that. Um, but yeah, if you want to be creative, be as creative as you can. Take the opportunity right now to be as creative as you possibly can be. Um, for me personally, and I think for the three of us, I'm working from home the, for the foreseeable future. Um, Jack's off. Sam obviously runs Trash Arts. And um, the time that we've actually had this week... We've managed to come up with some different ideas, some different concepts. You guys can do that as well. This is a great opportunity and a great platform for anyone who's within the creative arts, like any kind of arts, to just be creative. And yeah, I would implore you to do that. And guys, just want to say thank you all for listening. And um, yeah, <clears throat> basically, we hope you enjoyed the show. If you can give us a like, a subscribe, and uh, give us a comment if there's any kind of film you want us to review or you just want to pick us apart for our poor attention to detail. <laughs> you know, you're more than welcome to do that as well. Or even just my accent. That's fine. But we do appreciate it. We love you guys. And um, probably mostly give us a subscribe. We really love that. Um, I know I said that before, but do it again. <clears throat> Other than that, Trash Arts Take Out. Ta-da. Bye.